So what we're going to talk about today, can you hear me okay? We're good? Okay, we're going to talk about creating an online reputation. And I think that you'll find, it, you probably most of you already believe this is a very important um, area and becoming increasingly important because of the landscape of the world we live in. This is interesting to me. This was, um, let's see, it was August 2012. And this is in Wired Magazine, which is a very mainstream technology magazine. What they said, welcome to the new reputation economy. And that's, um, that's kind of big. Um, we, before, we talked about the internet economy. And for them to call it a reputation economy, I think, is significant. The other thing, uh, this article, and this was, I believe, Cornell University was talking about crowdsourcing online reviews. And the interesting statistic was that for the restaurants that did that, they saw a 19% increase in the likelihood that those seats would be filled during prime dining hours. That's a pretty significant number. The other thing that's in, that's I think makes sense in, in my mind as to why it's increasingly important is the Wired Magazine article was August, and, um, and I'm going to show you a couple clips from a really fantastic uh, presentation, a TED Talk. I don't know if you watch TED Talks. I watch a lot of TED Talks, and it's about reputation. But what we find is once mainstream press pick something up, it's often 9 to 12 months before we see it as mainstream kind of in our, in our world, in our community. So we're actually right at about that time if we use those statistics that reputation would be coming into a, a kind of a, a whole new important economy. I want to ask you this, you know, your reputation is an asset or it's a liability because there's really no neutral ground. There's four things in terms of your reputation. You can have a good reputation. You can have a bad reputation. All right? You can have no reputation, which frankly is a bad reputation. Or you can have a five-star reputation. And what I'm going to talk with you, and by the end of this session, we have one hour today, I'm going to give you some, actual, some action steps as far as, well, how do I get that five-star reputation? All right, and there's a, there's a lot of options. I'm just going to recommend ones that I've seen work the best. Um, all right, but so let's, let's think about this. When you, your reputation precedes you. And so I, I think that what, one of the things that we need to think about, just as we talk about the reputation economy, is that just what I'd like to see is that you get more tuned in to the idea of reputation and the importance of it. And... Probably some of you have had the example that I've seen with some of the lawyers that I've talked to, and that's this. They're, they're great attorneys. They do great work. Well, somebody gets angry at them for whatever reason, and unfortunately, it's a tech-savvy client, and they go out, and not only do they write something on one site, they write it on several. I had, just about two weeks ago, I had this exact experience with a friend of mine. Um, it's a family-owned pizza shop shop up the street. They've been in business 20 years. They're great. And they had a, um, a disgruntled, very unfair and just ridiculous customer. I won't go into the story. But here's what he did. He goes back um, and, and he decides, you know, he's angry. He felt that he was wronged. So not only does he write a bad review on Google, but he writes it on several review sites. So I'm in there and I said, oh, man, that, because my, my friend said, my gosh, you got totally slammed out there. Well, the, the reason you get slammed is because, and I'm going to show you this in a middle, in, in a minute, Google is now leading with reputation. She was, my friend was just going to look up directions or something or whatever. I don't know how she stumbled across, across this, but she, she said, oh my gosh, you, you terrible reputation. Well, actually what I did is I went in later and I said, well, let me, you know, I should have done this 20 years ago. They're great people. And I did go in and, and write some uh, some addition, some reviews based on my experience. Um, to, to sometimes that can help mitigate that, but obviously it's not a solution. I want to pose a couple questions, and I don't think any of us have the answers to these. But let's think about this: How can we convert our offline reputation to online capital? And, and one of the things that's interesting to me is and, and primarily I've worked with attorneys uh, often that are large advertisers and they have built a reputation. They haven't built it on the way that we build it today. They've built it a different way. So they've got all this power as a you know a 
great reputation, and, and frankly, I've talked to this, some of them over the years that have done so well in TV. They've done so well just because they've been there since things were fantastic for, for injury lawyers. And they, when social media became the big thing, they kind of didn't really want to get involved. Some of them weren't really involved now. And, and this is not something that they are that tuning into. Here's what I want to tell you. When I show you how Google is leading with reputation, here's what I'm observing as I do that research. When I go in and I do the research, because you see, uh, less than a year ago, Google decided to lead with reputation. And the first thing they did is they indexed 80 million businesses. So your business has probably been indexed as with everybody's out, or everybody else's. And now when somebody puts in, um, when somebody puts in a category, and a, um, if, they, if they put in a category like personal injury lawyer and then the city, Google is going to lead with, they're going to lead with reputation. And so what I'm finding is some of the, the, the attorneys that have really made it, they're not tuned into this. But guess what, when I do those searches, I've been around for 15 years in the, in the PI industry. I'm seeing a lot of attorneys that are coming up at the top that I don't even, I don't even heard of them. And some of the big players that have these huge offline reputations, it's not translating into online reputation. So what I want to say to you is it really, this really is important for all of us because there is not a, a natural progression from offline to online. What we want to know is how can we mimic the trust we've built face-to-face to an online world. I am not diminishing what you built face to face because that is, that's number one. That's gold. That's the gold standard. But, but let's face it, whether or not people find you online, they're probably going to confirm you online. So you have to have that online visible re reputation. Reputation is about trust. And trust, as some much smarter than me are saying, is the currency of the new economy. So how do we build online reputation? How do we build trust? How do we build trust online? Now, I just mentioned to you the idea that if you put in a category, if you put in a category, and if you, you know, if any of you are online now, if you just put in personal injury lawyer or whatever your category is, and then you put your city. And for me, I, when I finished this up last week and I wanted to get an example, I live in Philadelphia, so I just did Philadelphia. So I mean, um, actually, I just put in lawyer. Lawyer Philadelphia. And what you see is exactly what came up. And I'm just going to go through what I, here's what I would have, what I would have drawn from what I saw. Okay, I look at that, I see these seven people. Now right away, two of them stand out to me. The first one, Astor Weiss, the reason they stand out is because they're first. And we have, often we think, okay, they're first, they must be good. So we look at first, and then the other one that stood out, and obviously I tipped my hand here, is Sheraton and Murray. And the reason that is, is because as you can see, they have 15 Google reviews, they have a score of 28. Now, I really encourage you to, to go ahead and, and check this for yourself. Look at the category, find your own. Because here's what happens with those. You may say, well, why doesn't anybody else have a score? Well, you don't even get a score until you have a certain number of reviews. So, but once you get the scores, you can see it lends itself to some credibility. So I said, okay, well, I would, first I would look at those two. So let me go a little further. So I went to Sheridan Murray, and I looked at them. Well, here's the first thing I saw. And again, this is just my thought process that I'm sharing. And what you need to do is you need to think this through from your market and their perspective, which is not an easy thing to do, but we have to pull from something. So the first thing I saw is, okay, they have not merged their Google Plus and their Google Local. Because what you see at that top where the arrows are, it says about and photos. Well, if it was merged, it would look like this. It would have all four categories. So a little thing, the technology is important to me. So I thought, okay, well, one small strike against them, not real technology savvy. They also looked at the review, and I get my magnifying glass out here, and it was, okay, so the, the first review was a year ago. But I like the four pictures at top. It looks aesthetically pleasing to me. So she's definitely still in the running here. Then I go to ask her why. So, okay, they merged their Google account. That's good. Their other big thing they have is they have two recent reviews. All right? And again, you look at the date on this. Two months ago. All right? So they have reviews as recently as two months ago. 
that's a good thing too. What they don't have is they don't have the nice pictures across the top. They have a couple, but this, this site is not optimized. So in the end, uh, well, actually, the next thing I did, I went in and looked at them because here's what happens. I told you, you can go in and you can do directory. I'm sorry, you put put in category and city, all right? And then the other thing you can do is you can just put in company and city. So it, when I went in and I put in the name of the firm, Astor Weiss, they, Google is also leading with reputation here. So if you look at this and you go down that list, what do we see here? Um, we see, let's see, Yelp. Um, super lawyers, those are, all, those are all review sites. So once again, Google is saying, you want to know about this company? Here's where I would start, reputation. All right, that looks pretty good. But here, here is the tipping point. This was the big tipping point in my mind. If I needed a lawyer in Philadelphia, the first thing I would do is call this company, and here's the reason. When I went in and I looked at company and city for Sheridan, you see what she has with the little picture? That's called Google authorship. And you see how she stands out there? Not only does she stand out because she's got 28 reviews, but she also stands out because she's got Google authorship. How does that happen? It can happen for you. It's a mechanical process. And your web people can do that for you, and many of you that has been done. It's a snippet. And what happens is they're pulling your Google personal profile they're linking them. And you see that she, what she's linked here, and it says um, Sheridan, and then it says, and <laughs> I'm struggling with this, how many Google circles? About 34, I think. So I think, oh, you know what? Let me look a little further. Let's see what this, uh, you know, what this woman is about. So I now click right through. I go to her per personal Google profile. Did you get that part? A personal Google profile. It's not her company. It's her, and I start looking. I want to see. Well, what's she done here? I see a few sports things. All right, I like that. She's a well-rounded person. I see a couple interesting things about the wall. I think, okay, so she's, you know, competence. Competence is pretty much assumed, but I want to make sure she has it. Here's what she did, and here was the tipping point in my mind, and I really mean this because I just went through this naturally. She put a human face on her brand. That's what she did that created the tipping point in my mind. My question to you is, how are you putting a human face on your brand? Now, I want to go to my buddy here, Zane Cagle. Some of you know Zane. And Zane is very good at putting a human face on his brand. And so this is, if you go in and you do, and I, you know, I looked up Zane's thing, and, okay, so you can see he has the authorship, right? It pulls him in. Now, look at this. 1,530 Google Plus circles. That's a lot of circles. So again, that's a little bit of a tipping point because I think, hmm, most of these guys, let's see, I saw another big Philadelphia attorney, she's in 34, Zane's in 1,500. And I'll tell you why Zane's in those. Because his marketing director and sister extraordinaire, who has a PhD in education, she's the one that works at that. So you don't even have to do it yourself. I'm sure you have a staff member that can help you with that. He's in 1,500 circles. That's, that's credibility. And again, it's all personal. Now we go to his his page. And the first thing I see, it was his birthday last week, and there's a picture that says the do it box. Now there's certainly stuff there about, I see <laughs> his buddies, John, and <laughs> I, the, I see here, he's, he's got some personal stuff here, right? But he's also got some business stuff here. So once again, what Zane did very, very well, he put a, a human face on his brand. That is very important. Now, next point. This is, this is the next section I'm going to go to is mechanical. There are a lot of mechanical things that you can do in order to get. Remember, what you want to do here is when somebody puts in category, lawyer, personal injury lawyer, and city, you want to come up first. That's what we're talking about. That's what online reputation is. Online reputation is, is found online. Your verbal, your reputation offline, people are talking about. Online, they're typing, they're searching. What you want, the end game here is, they put in category, city, boom, there you are in that top seven. Here's some steps to get you in the top seven. They're mechanical, they're easy, they're administrative, but many people don't realize what they are. The first thing is what's called, you need a consistent citation. 
And all that is is your basically your firm name, your address, your phone number. It has to be consistent. I went back and once again I used the example of Astor Weiss and Sheraton. Now if you look at Astor Weiss, and if you can see better than I, you can see that the um, address for Astor Weiss is two different ways. In Google, they do not use Suite 600, but in Yelp, they do. For the most part, your competitors are totally missing that because they don't realize it's important. But it is. A consistent citation leads to authority. And when those first seven places come up in Google, they come up for a couple of reasons. Your online reviews, that's one of them. But your authority is another one. And authority in Google is established by a number of things, one of which is the consistency of your citation across all brands. Now, most of you, this is being done for you. Your citation is out there if you have SEO people. And the work of SEO people to date is typically done, and you don't really know much about it because it's just, you know, it's over there. It's over your head. It's over my head, too. I'm not an SEO person. But what I do understand is this, and this is basically just I know that I need to have consistent citation for my attorneys across all sites, and that's going to help them. Here's another big point that I want to tell you. Your vendors cannot work in a vacuum anymore. And I really encourage you, as the leader of your teams, to make sure that there is a collaborative environment with your vendors. And here's the reason. Because you know what? If you have one vendor, and I've seen this happen, if you have one vendor that's going out in an effort to help you, they've set up, you know, the rest of you, they've set these all up, and then somebody else comes along because they're doing another aspect of your work, and they set up your citation a little differently, then what happens, it's, it's not like you're going to, it's not some big thing's going to happen that's terrible, but what is going to happen is you're going to miss an opportunity for optimal performance. And I want to tell you something else. You know, I, I talked to Jay Abraham recently. I don't know if you know him. He's, he's really been a hero of mine for years. He's a, no one is really the market, the world's greatest marketing strategist. And I, I published a magazine called Law Firm Marketing Magazine, and I did a cover story on him. It was fascinating to talk with him, and here's the biggest thing that he talked about. He talked about um, strategic preeminence, and what he means by that, he said that so many of us as business owners, we are content to be uh, successful and profitable. We're content to be profitable, but we don't push the envelope. And so something like this, most people would say, oh, for Pete's sakes, so she uses 600 one place and not 600 the other, who cares? Well, if that gives you just a little ability, ability to get a 1% advantage, and you do that 10 different places in your business, that's 10%. And what Jay said is, he said, if, if business owners would understand that there are so many opportunities in your business to improve by 1%, and if you would start doing, I see a couple head nods because you guys are probably doing that. You're, it's a competitive advantage because most of your competitors aren't. But if you'll just take those 1% opportunities and start implementing, and so many of them, this is an administrative job that, you're, that a 12 buck an hour employee could easily do this for you with guidance and assist and a strategic plan. But that's an opportunity for optimal ROI. Now let's look at Sheridan. Okay, so for Sheridan, this is an even smaller thing. She uses number 2500, and then she uses, uses it without the number. Again, I don't want to scare anybody, I really don't think anything is going to happen bad. It's not that big of a deal. But here's what is happening. It's a missed opportunity for optimal ROI. How many of you want optimal ROI in your business? All of you. Right. Thank you. All of you want optimal ROI. These are little things you can do to achieve that. So your unique address matters. Here's another point I want you to understand. Now, for the most part, your attorneys in your office are probably not out there setting up their own online reputation information. They're probably not out there doing it. But because Google brought in 80 million businesses and indexed that, a lot of them are in there. And I was talking to an attorney just two days ago, and I was talking about the importance of having their one attorney that's out there. Um, we've got to differentiate his address. Here's why. You've decided on your citation now. You've let your team know. Everybody's using the same citation, but then you have an attorney in the firm that either, either has gone out and set up their own listings, or Google has just brought them in because maybe they're a, a well-known attorney. 
And it's the exact same address. It's the exact same address, but instead of the firm name, it's the attorney's name. That's not 100% consistent. Is it a problem? It's not going to be, an, it's not that big a deal, but it's a missed opportunity for optimal ROI. So experts are saying, and this could change next week because things change all the time, but experts are saying right now, when your attorneys do that, if they've done that, or if it's being done and, and it needs to be corrected, what you want to do is you want to use a different suite number. That's enough to differentiate. Again, it's about optimal ROI. So if this attorney has suite 20, if, if the firm is suite 2500, you have the attorney, attorney do suite 2510. Actually, before I move on, let me just tell you this. <clears throat> Optimizing your profiles, and like we saw in the beginning, some, one of them had a lot of pictures and things, and the other one didn't. You cannot optimize your profile until you go in and claim it and verify it. Once again, this, is a, this step is a huge opportunity for all of you. And the reason is this. Very few of those sites out there are clean. You're, if you go out and you look at the main sites, I'm going to tell you which ones I think are the main ones for, to get on your radar. If you look at them, you're, you're out there most likely. All right. Oftentimes, there's not complete, completely um, correct information. If you want to correct that, you actually have to go through a process of going in, claiming the site, and verifying. And this is something you really need to do within your firm. The reason is because they want to contact you at your firm. Whatever phone number you use, whatever address you use, Google's going to contact you and the other sites too, either by a phone call or by an a, a postcard, and they're going to want to put a PIN number in to verify that site. That needs to be done by you. The biggest disconnect I'm seeing is this. Firms, you know, maybe I work with them or, or the, whatever, they're trying to do that. But the call comes in, and it's an automated call that says your PIN number is 12345. And the front, you know, the operator gets it, right? And they're like, what is it, crank call? I don't know what this is. And, and so the information is never translated, and therefore the site is not confirmed. Now, I had somebody else, and this is just a caution to you. I had somebody else say, and he was doing so good because he was really trying to get these sites claimed for his firm. He said, well, how about if I just change the phone number until I get it claimed? That's not a good option either, okay, because you need to have, again, that consistent citation is even more important. All right, so, and, and one more tip that I actually got from ConsultWebs, Dale Tincher, is this. Google wants to see a local number. So if your number is 207, blah, 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 what you, want in, what you want indexed is that prime number for your citation is a local number, not your 800 number. But for many of you, your 800 number is a huge part of your branding. So you certainly need to get it out there. And what Dale suggested, actually one of his SEO people, which I thought was brilliant, he said use that 800 number, but bring it in as an image. Because then it's not going to foul up Google's algorithms. All right, so that was a tip, and um, I, thought it, I thought it was a good one. All right, are you review worthy? Because now we've established what you need to do mechanically to set the stage here. But are you review worthy? And that's the next thing. Again, remember what we talked about? That Zane and Miss Sheraton put a human face on their brand? Because you see, one of the things that I think we all understand, but sometimes we don't think about, is your competence is assumed. Now, if you're Jerry Spence, you know, it's, you have a huge competitive advantage because you're just the best. But most of us are not just the best. We may be the best in our market, but you have to really be at a high level before that's enough. All right? So if, if, if you're not at that high level, then understand this, that the reason you're getting chosen usually is not because of your competence, because people are assuming that. And I talk about Starbucks as being my favorite brand. I really enjoy Starbucks. It's part of my routine. But it's not about the coffee. I enjoy their coffee, but there's a lot of places I could go for good coffee. It's about the experience because they position themselves as part of their marketing strategy. They position themselves as the third place. And so what happens is I go to Starbucks to my friends. I used to say they're like my coworkers. I go see them. You know, they know my drink. They chat. We, you know, we do. We talk. And so. That's what it's about. It's about that human face. I want to mention what I thought was a fascinating conversation I had with a friend, John Bisnar, out in California. And I was talking with John. And I also interviewed him for the magazine. And here's what he talked about. He talked about 
he runs a mastermind group of really they're, they're very successful attorneys. And he was telling me that in, um, in the meetings, one of the things that they do. Okay, so the client comes in the office and he talked about when he explained this, what I'm going to tell you, I was talking to, to Ryan Pitts, who was a, a real good guy too. He does um, intake numbers and things. And Ryan said, yes, that's intake choreography. I had never heard that term, but it's pretty interesting. And here's how John does it, okay? So he, he has his mastermind group, and in talking about what Jay Abraham calls that strategic preeminence, working towards optimal ROI, okay, here's what these guys do. One of the things they did is, well, they, they worked on a menu. So one guy had, when the, when the client comes in, um, what John says is he wants them, he, he kind of orchestrates that client, the receptionist knows that client, he wants him to be in the waiting room five, at least five minutes, but not more than ten. He wants them to absorb the aesthetic around, uh, the surroundings of the room. He's in a beautiful building, there's fountains and things. He wants them to kind of absorb that. And during that time, what's even more important is he wants to kind of wow them. So the whoever is manning that front office area, they're, they're instructed a couple of ways. Number one, to offer a beverage. And I think most of you do that. Most people do offer a beverage. But they do something a little beyond that. They actually offer some light snacks. And so what they do is they bring out this menu. And in the mastermind group, he said somebody did a menu and then somebody else said, well, what if we laminate the menu? And somebody else said, well, may we do this? And pretty soon, they're testing different types of menus. Again, it's about optimal ROI. Let me go back to Jay Abraham because a lot of you may be thinking, this is crazy, I don't have time for this stuff. But you know what? Here's what Jay said, and this, this blew me away too. He said he was working with a furniture store in North Carolina, and they were testing. Of course, this is a, you know, a multi-million dollar company, which actually many of you guys have multi-million dollar brands. And in working with them, they tested 34 ways to greet the customer at the door. The, prospect at the door. When Jay told me that, my first thought was, woo, he's, I thought, this is Jay Abraham, so this has got to be important, but I have never heard of something like that. Well, it made a small difference, but in scale, those small differences over time could go from the half percent here and the half percent here, and now you're 10 percent, and it gives you a huge strategic advantage. All right, so intake choreography not only did John, they started to play with menus and test menus, but here's the next thing he did. They thought, okay, so what John does, he listens carefully. When the person comes in, they have two options for conference rooms. One of the th things they do for their, their, uh, their intake choreography, they'll have a plaque, a simple plaque. I don't know if it's paper, if it's what it is, but the client's name will be on it. And there's a little placeholder. So when that client walks into the conference room for the meeting, their name is on the door another wow point. But not only that, if they say, John has two conference rooms, one, one of the rooms is awards and just credibility, but they also have a conference room that has a whole lot, actually, do I have it here? There it is. They have a whole lot of Lakers stuff in there because they're in Lakers country. So if the client says anything about sports, the word is that that receptionist passes that along and the, and the, um, the client's name plaque is quickly switched over to the, to the Lakers conference room. Now they walk into the Lakers conference room. That's about 1% differences. It really is. And, and we skipped a couple slides here, but basically in, in making yourself re review worthy, in working on reputation, it's not about confidence, it's, it, confidence, it's about emotional connections. It's about emotional connections. So one of the things that, that I, I like to think of, and I actually think of this in my own business, I love it when a tipping point opportunity comes my way. And you know, you can train your staff to get excited about looking for those tipping point possibilities. I mean, there's opportunities that happen. And I'm going to tell you a real brief one here. And I have a friend named Dave Barletta who 20 years ago... I was, um, I was purchasing video equipment, a lot of video equipment, like $20,000 worth. It was a big, big purchase, but he had no idea of that. I walked in to a, a place where he worked. It was 6 o'clock. The place was about to close, 
And I, you know, I, was, I said, oh, oh, okay, I'll come back another day. And Dave was walking out, and he said, oh, no, no, I'll talk to you. And he's a real laid-back guy. He took me back to his, like, cubicle there, and we talked for an hour. And you know what he did? He educated me. He didn't pitch me a thing. He educated me. And I was so appreciative. You know why? Because he went above and beyond. Now, I ended up buying a lot of equipment, and he's been my go-to guy for 20 years. I have a studio now. Dave wired it. Dave set it up. Dave did anything, did everything. Because you know what? He created a tipping point in my mind, and, and it was simply, it was an emotional connection. He did the right thing. I won't go into too many of the others, because, again, I want to make sure we're careful in time, because when I tested this presentation, I was a little over, so I don't want to go too long. But you get the idea. You can train your staff. You can get your staff excited about creating tipping points. And that's something that has to do with firm culture. And actually, on Thursday, I'm going to talk about firm culture, because that's another important thing that adds to reputation when you create a culture where that's happening. Reputation is going to affect all of your marketing, your TV, your magazines, everything. Now, why is a five-star reputation so important? Well, what we found, and this is current research, and again, it's going to change next month. It's going to be different next month. But right now, consumers are looking up an average of 10 reviews before they make a, de a decision. So if they see six to 10 reviews, then they're pretty confident that you're a pretty good person. All right? But this is the one that I can't believe. 70% of consumers trust online reviews. Now, what we see is 92% trust referrals from people. That makes perfect sense. But look below that. 58% trust newspaper articles. So these online reviews, which are strangers talking to strangers, are now trusted to the tune of 70%. Here's important things for you to know. People are unlikely to choose companies if the first thing they see is bad reviews or no reviews at all. It's a, it's a big problem. And here's the reason, because like I said, you, we know that Google has only recently, in the last year, changed so that they're leading with reputation. So as that's happening more and more, it makes it more and more important to get your reputation in order. Your business reputation is first. The average consumer looks at 10 reviews. So your goal, I believe, today should be get, you know, create a culture, create a plan, because there, there really needs to be some strategy to this. Um, people are not going to walk up and say, you know what, I love you, man. I'm going to write a review for you. That is not going to happen. It's just not. You have to work a system out. You have to help them a little bit. And actually, I will tell you that Simon, Simon is going to be speaking this afternoon. I just, he just came up and showed me he has a book on uh, testimo getting testimonials, and he has a whole system for it. So you might want to talk to Simon later, too, because he's in this space. And I want to tell you a quick thing about Simon, because he's a friend, and I, I get such a kick out of him. When I first met Z Simon, I thought, ooh, he talks in binary code or something. I, I'm, a, I'm a technology person, but honestly, he was like over my head. And I'm like, ooh, I don't even know what he's saying. What I've come to know, he came and spent some time with me in Philadelphia, and we had a blast. And what I found is that this guy is brilliant. But when he talks in binary code, you can really miss it. So spend a little time with him, because he knows what he's talking about. He really does. Anyway, let's, I want to show a very short clip here. And it's uh, this woman, her name is Rachel Watsman. And she did this TED Talk. And it's going to tell you a little bit about what we're talking about here. Now, when you think about it, it's amazing, right, that over the past 20 years, we've evolved from trusting people online to share information to trusting to handing over our credit card information. And now we're entering the third trust wave, connecting trustworthy strangers to create all kinds of people-powered marketplaces. I actually came across this fascinating study by the Pew Center this week that revealed that an active Facebook user is three times as likely as a non-internet user to believe that most people are trustworthy. Virtual trust will transform the way we trust one another face to face. Virtual trust, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. So, let's talk about an action plan. What do you do when you go back? Okay, the first thing is, and again, this is mechanical, you want a consistent citation for each office. And let me just say that, you, that you need to preface things by you need to make sure 
that you're, you're, there's a collaboration with your team and you need to establish that citation. And if you have SEO people, they would be the ones to establish that. All right, and certainly you, you're the, the, the main one, but they're gonna make the recommendation for you. And then collaborate, okay, this is our citation. But I want you to also understand this real quickly. If you have six offices, ideally, you should go through this process for each office, and here's the reason. I, I actually was just talking to somebody the other, the other day, and he has six offices. And what I said is, I said, you know, you really need to, we need to index each one of those because his main office is in Portland. But I, he has Augusta and Bangor and some other ways. And when I went in and I looked at him, I was pleasantly surprised that he actually comes up in that top seven several different places. And I, I'll mention that I believe his uh, people, I talked to a woman named Paige over Voodoo Interactive. They're terrific. And I think they're going to present something here today too. But I, I, was, I said, woo, man, that, they're really good because he came up right at the top in several of those states, even though he hasn't done all this yet. But once, one city, he did not come up at all in those first seven. So I said, is, I said, if we set up all these citations, that may bring you into those first seven. Okay, so what Voodoo Interactive is doing, they're doing SEO, and they're doing a great job of it. But in addition, this reputation stuff needs to happen as well. Next, you need to choose the platforms. I'm going to show you that in a minute, but it's not difficult to figure out what they are. They're pretty mainstream. Then you need to claim the listings and verify the listings. The next thing is the Google Merge. Let me just mention this to you. If you have SEO people, talk to them about getting this done. They will do that. This is a little bit tricky, and you need to do it correctly. So what I encourage you to do is get some counsel from some expert that you trust on the Google Merge before you do that. It's a very important decision. Then your, your listings need to be optimized. And then next, as I said, you need to create a reputation marketing culture because they're not gonna walk up and say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna write a review for you. And again, we're gonna talk more about culture on Thursday. Here's some platforms that I would, that I would recommend. Certainly Google's the granddaddy. Yelp is second. And then on the left, si on the left side, you'll see right. I think of her like my favorite first tier sites, Insider Search, City, Insider Pages, City Search, some of those, and then on the right side. Now I want to tell you a few little tricks and tips I've noticed here. Changes all the time. What I'm noticing, Google is very difficult right now to get reviews. Um, it just seems to be harder. Part of it is you still have to create a Gmail account for a while. It's hard enough to get a client to set up a Gmail account and write a review. But then what was happening is it had to be an aged account. Well, that's even more difficult because now if you get them to set up the account, but they just did it today, that didn't stick either. But I've, I'm seeing some of them stick now. As I said, it changes all the time. But there's a great back door to Google. And here's what it is. I've noticed that on Google, what they're doing is they're pulling in, they're not pulling in the actual reviews. They used to do that, which is great because other sites are easier to get people to post to. But what they are doing is they're pulling in links. So on your Google um, profile, you may see um, things around the web, and it may list your inside. Uh, click, click over your insider pages, uh, your city search. Kutsu is one I see a lot. Judy's book is one I see a lot. And so, what happens is, if you can get your clients to post on some of those t sites, they often get pulled in. I have seen just again what I'm seeing in my recent research. Judy's book is one that I'm noticing um, sends out. So, if you can get clients to, it, that's one that should be on your radar because you get more bang for the buck. If, Judy, if they write it on Judy's book and it goes four other places, that's good. Okay? Um, and a yellow bot is one that I'm seeing pull in. So that's important too. Avo, a quick word from Avo. Avo, I think they're a great company and they are absolutely on the top of the radar in the legal industry. Uh, they may be on the top of the industry in the consumer industry. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't know if, if they're mainstream like LegalZoom is. And they may be. They're certainly headed that way. But I was pleasantly surprised the other day to find that one of the sites, I actually forget which one, pulled in Avo reviews. And I thought, okay, well that's a sign that they're going mainstream when, when review sites pull in from Avo. It was one of the, the sites on, this, on these platforms that was pulling in Avo. So let me give you a couple of review strategies because now you say, all right, how do I get a review? One of the things I recommend is that you set up a review page on your website. And your web people can do that. Here's the reason. 
Because you know what, I guarantee you at some point you are going to have people that are ticked off at you and maybe you didn't take their case because it was soft tissue and it made no sense, but they're, they don't understand that. And so they want to write a review. Well, in some instances, not only can you use that review page as a positive, but you can maybe deflect what they're doing. So if they're angry and they go to your website and they find that page, writing a review on that page may satisfy them so that they then go out to three other review sites. Now, the, we, actually pages that I've seen set up, and again, a lot of places you can, uh, any web company could do this, but what we do is we control those pages internally. So when the client posts, we get their, you know, all their information, but, and, and it's not going to another site, it's, it's internal, but you can still use the reviews on your website, okay? But if a client is angry and they're like, they go to your website, they write a bad review, at least you've contained it there. Once they go over to Google, you can't contain it anymore. The second thing I would do is after, if they decide to post a review on your web page, which is not the same as a review site, it's not, it's just your web page. But if they go to the trouble of writing a review, in my mind they've just kind of qualified themselves that they like you pretty good. Then I would redirect them to a page where you can try to get them to just get a redirect and send, well, you know what, we really appreciate that. If you wouldn't mind, it would be awesome if you would actually go to one of these sites and write the same review. Redirect them to Google, Yelp, one of those places. Here's another thing that a few people are doing, and, we're, and I'm seeing good results from it. If you set up a small, um, a small test here, okay, put, I say 100, but you know what, you can set up a list. You can have your, your firm say, like, give me a list of 50 clients that love us. And then get someone, and what I would recommend, someone that you know, someone that, that really knows the business, um, could be the, a wife of one of the partners, something like that, or you know, whatever. But get them to call clients. And I would just have them ask a couple of things, which I'm going to show you in the actual form. Find out, you're, you're basically doing this for a couple of reasons. Ask them to, re to rate the, res the experience, and then ask them what specifically did you like? I'm going to actually set my timer because I just got the 15 minute. Thank you, Russ. Um, what specifically did they like or not like? And then if they gave you something positive, then I would ask them for a review. And then somehow, in a qualitative interview, you need to assess them. Do they know how to do that or not? Some review sites, and this is really good news for all of us, some of the review sites are now allowing you to log in with Facebook. Because you know the obstacle we have with trying to get clients to set up Gmail accounts. Some of these review sites, you can now log right in with Facebook. So what I would do, here's, here's what I would say. I would not actually hire a $10 an hour administrative person to do this particular job. I would look for a middle-aged woman. Um, I, I just would. Somebody that's caring, has warmth and compassion in their voice. And I think that a, a wife of a partner or if it's a female, and I don't think the husbands probably won't want to do this. And actually, I think probably a woman is a good one for this job just because of personality, you know, the way that we're built genetically. But, but when you do this, if you have them call and you go through this, here's what we're finding in early tests. That with three hours on the phone, we're getting clients to post two reviews. That may seem like a lot, but if you get two reviews on Google in a month, do you know how significant that is for your business? It's really significant. Here's an example of a web, of a web page. And again, you put this on your site, and you can see this is just, you know, this is an example one. If you put this on your site, you can see that there's the, the attorney, there's the, um, the form for them to fill out. But then on the right, we actually pull in, we pull in just by, you know, an RSS, we're pulling in leads from other review sites. They can click and go right there. That's social proof. And as I said, it may protect you from them going to other review sites. So you can control what they see. And it may offset disgruntled clients. Okay, here's saying this is a redirect to an actual review page. So if someone has pre-qualified themselves, they've written a review or they've said, you know, whatever, Zane has a conversation and somebody, and they decide they're gonna write this review, then give them the ammunition to do that. So what we have here is just, here's a list, and those, those links would go directly to, Zoom, to Zane's online platforms, directly to Google, directly to Yelp, directly to Insider Pages. And then actually a couple weeks ago, I wanted to test something new. It's like, how do we empower the clients? 
I think right now one of the more promising things is this Facebook Connect. Because getting clients to log in with Facebook is going to be easier. But still, that's not going to work for Google. How in the world do we get them to do it through Google? All right, we could, you know, there's a lot of things we could do. But what I did is I actually, this Your Voice Matters, what I did is I created a 45-minute training session. And it talks about how this will empower the client, not just for, for us, but it's, it's educating and empowering the client to be able to participate in today's world with today's tools. Will we get anybody to watch that? I don't know. But you know what? If you don't test these things, you're never going to know. So we're going to test it. Survey under clients by phone. Now, what I did is I just set up a little survey for this. And here's what I did. And suppose you have a person, your warm, caring person that's going to do this. Here's what the steps are. Log into your Google account. Go to Drive. And then over on the left, there's a drop down. Choose Form. Once you set up that, you get the form, and it's really easy, a couple quick steps. Set up a form, then you have a link to share the form, email it to the one or more people that are going to make these phone calls, choose a destination, again, this resides in the cloud, and so I've saved it at Satisfaction Survey in my account, and then when my people are out there and they're doing that, I don't do this, this is a test, but if, if you have it, I just set this up and I filled in one myself. Okay, so then what happens is, okay, so I have a couple people out there, they're doing this for the lawyer or whatever, and I go in to look at the results, and I get this nice little spreadsheet. I just pull it right out. Very simple, all free. The future, a reputation economy. What we believe is that there's going to be some kind of a reputation dashboard, and we see that emerging in some different places. There's Connect Me, um, Cloud. I don't think Cloud is, is working, but it's not the kind of dashboard that Connect Me is. And there's some other um, some others that are coming, but I want to just because we're short on time, I want to just go right to this other clip on Rachel because she really sums it up great. Because the future is going to be driven by a smart aggregation of reputation, not a single algorithm. It's only a matter of time before we'll be able to perform a Facebook or Google-like search and see a complete picture of someone's behaviors in different contexts over time. I envision a real-time stream of who has trusted you, when, where, and why. Your reliability on TaskRabbit, your cleanliness as a guest on Airbnb, the knowledge that you just display on Cora or TripOverVo, they'll all live together in one place. And this will live in a some kind of reputation dashboard that will paint a picture of your reputation capital. Now, this is a concept that I'm currently researching and writing my next book on and currently define as the worth of your reputation your intentions, capabilities, and values across communities and marketplaces. This isn't some far off frontier. There are actually a wave of startups like Connect Me and Legit and Cross Trust Cloud that are figuring out how you can aggregate, monitor, and use your online reputation. Now, I realize that this concept may sound a little big brother to some of you. And yes, there are some enormous transparency and privacy issues to solve. But ultimately, if we can collect our personal reputation, we can actually control it more and extract the immense value that will flow from it. Also, more so than our credit history, we can actually shape our reputation. Ultimately, when we get it right, Reputation capital could create a massive positive disruption in who has power, trust, and influence. A three-digit score, your traditional credit history, that only 30% of us actually know what it is, it will no longer be the determining factor in how much things cost, um, what we can access, and in many instances, limit what we can do in the world. Indeed, reputation is a currency that I believe will become more powerful than our credit history in the 21st century. Reputation will be the currency that says that you can trust me. Cindy, isn't that already true in the real world? Yeah, I think so. I think so. In the virtual world? You know what? That's a good point, Howard. It really is no different. It's just that there's different tools. And one of the disconnects that's, that's happened is so many of the times our clients don't have those new tools. They don't understand them. And that's why I think right now what I'm testing is how do we empower them? 
So we're trying a training program, we're trying phone calls. I'm not sure. It's going to be testing and measuring, and that goes back to what Jay Abraham talks about, that incremental improvements for optimal ROI. So here's something else, and this is Rachel again, and you can look her up. It's TED Talks. I think her presentation's phenomenal. But she says, a good reputation can be used by cooperation from others, even people we have never met. And um, that, actually, you know what, I do have one more quick clip from her just to end with, so let me, let me play that. Huh? What is her last name again? Botsman. It's B-O-T-S-M-A-N. I believe that we are at the start of a collaborative revolution that will be as significant as the Industrial Revolution. In the 20th century, the invention of traditional credit transformed our consumer system and in many ways controlled who had access to what. In the 21st century, new trust networks and the reputation capital they generate will reinvent the way we think about wealth, markets, power, and personal identity in ways we can't yet even imagine. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that is it. I appreciate your attention, and um, thank you. Okay, do we have time for questions, Ken? Do we have time for questions? Five minutes, okay. You want to step at the mic so they can hear you too? Sure. I just want to know what happened to the pizza place. Yeah, you know what? It's, it's definitely damaged their reputation. What, here's what I did. I went out, not that it's that big a help, but I went out because I love them and because I'm motivated because I care about them. I've spent probably an hour writing reviews on four different sites, and my friend was going to do that as well. Um, those are, we care about them. We want to help them. But the fact is, that terrible reputation, we, you can't get rid of that. I've, a couple of times I have contacted sites, I, I know on behalf of a client I did city search because it was, it was clearly somebody with an ax to grind. A couple times I was able to get them down, but you know what, that doesn't happen too often. You're pretty much stuck with it. So it's devastating, but you know what, that brings out a great point, and that's this. Oh boy, have I got, I'm 56 years old now, and I'll tell you what, I am a whole lot mellower than I was 20 years ago, and I'm a whole lot carefuler what I say. Because it is not worth ticking somebody off. They are so empowered today. They can destroy you. And I, there's one attorney that I actually um, am thinking of who is a phenomenal attorney. But he's got a couple terrible reviews. And the first thing you see, it's a problem. Anybody else have a question? Good. Can you speak to what impact LinkedIn endorsements have in what you've discussed? Yeah, now, now for me in my business, LinkedIn is more powerful for me. And that's the reason because I'm in a B2B. I work, but for those of you that are working with, for, in the consumer, your, your clients are consumers, then I definitely think that these online review sites are more important. So LinkedIn, I do not think, has a whole lot of impact for your, your um, injury clients. Do you, you work with injury clients? Yeah. So I don't think LinkedIn is quite, it gives credibility, but I don't think the client is as likely to go there as they will to a consumer-driven platform where these reviews are. But it impacts your credi credibility for referrals. Yeah. John, yeah. Um, do you think Yelp has much impact? Huge. Absolutely huge impact. I think Yelp is right up there next to Google. Yelp is a huge one. Very, very important. Yeah. You said uh, Google likes aged G Plus accounts for reviews. How aged? Yeah. How, how, how much age? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. And, and as I um, had mentioned, I, recently, I think that might be changing. I think they might be lightening up. For a while there, you just couldn't, couldn't you know, the clients were, were writing them, and the next day they were disappearing. They were, just weren't sticking. But I think it's a little better now. I do not know the answer as to how aged. Okay. Thanks again. Right. Thank you, Sandy. Good stuff. Thank you.